and you're with us, and I know that you are. There is no one like unto you. Father, you made the heavens, you made the earth, and there is absolutely nothing too big, nor is there anything too small. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would move and touch us tonight. God, we need the touch of the Master's hand. I'm asking you, Lord, would you anoint the singing, the musicians, God, that will all just be used of you. And God, to bring honor and glory unto you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, stay standing. We're going to sing from the hymnal tonight. page 94. I'm in a new world.
lose them. We lose the thought of them. But if you really ponder on it, I'll fly away. Because whether you're in your grave before he comes, or whether you're still standing here on earth when he comes, we get to fly away with him. He's going to catch us up to be with him forever and ever. That's another hard concept for the thinkers. What? What's forever mean? Because we're so used to only live 80 years or whatever, or whatever our lifespan is that God gives us. No, this is, there is no time in heaven. He transcends all time. So praise God, we get to live with him forever and ever. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we sing some glad morning. Yeah. It's going to be a good morning, isn't it? Yeah. It's going to be a good morning when we all get to go see Jesus. Yeah. And we hear him say, we all die. Yeah. Kind of like I, I hear people talk about, so that's what we're living for, is to be able to go to heaven. That's and the day that's going to be, when we know Jesus, we shall see. We look upon his face, the one who saved us by his grace. What a day. What a day that's going to be. Hallelujah. I want us to worship God tonight through our giving. Ushers will come at this time to, to serve you. And I, I'm going to ask you to do something. Come on, ushers. I want to ask you to do something with me. How many of you remember what I preached Sunday morning? I've done good. I got one hand went up. <laughs> Two, three, four. We preached about being joyful. Whenever it comes time to serving God. And so I'm going to ask you to help me to do something on Sunday morning. You're the, you're the crowd that is going to help to lead our church into this. That whenever it comes time to worship God in giving, I just want you to give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Yes. Can we just start that tonight? Just thank God that we're able to give to Him. good to us. God is good to us and God loves a cheerful giver. I want us to be cheerful. I want us to be happy whenever it comes to serving the Lord and giving back unto Him. You've heard me say this so many times and I'm probably going to say it a thousand more. You're not giving anything to God tonight that God's not giving to you first. And God has, has trusted you and I with His, with His to see what we will do with it. And I am so thankful that God trusts me tonight that I can give back unto him. God is good, isn't he? Oh, yeah. All the time. God is so good. Brother Ed, will you pray God's blessings on the offering for us tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we get to give to you. Father God, we worship and we praise you. Father God, take these offerings that are given tonight and let it go forward. Let it move your kingdom forward in this church in the name of Jesus. Father God, use it, bless it. Bless those that can give. Bless those that can't give tonight. Father God, pour out your blessings upon this offering this night in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. just richly, richly bless you. I, I want to say thanks once again. I, I tell you, I've, I've thought about this this past week and uh, what Sister Diane is doing about reaching out into the community. That just means so much. And uh, if you're interested in supporting and helping this, there is a sheet out there upon the welcome desk. And it'll tell you about some of the supplies that they can use. And I, I just want God to really help us to reach out 
uh, to touch a lot of hearts and lives. This coming Saturday morning, Women's Brunch. Uh, so ladies, don't forget about that. And uh, also our youth uh, service and activities on March the 9th, which is Saturday week at uh, 1030. Driston and Hannah will be ministering in the service. Now everybody's welcome to come to the service. You may not want to stay and play games with them afterwards, but you're welcome to come and, uh, and be with them in the service. And I know that you will be touched and be blessed. And then Tristan and Hannah will be back with us that Sunday for both of the services. On the 16th, as our seniors, uh, TNT, lively, exciting. Want everybody to get involved, involved in that. Sister Diane, tell us where the yard sale is going to be. Um, Bill Bailey who used the sick with the use any of that property and it, he said no we're having a memorial service however they have purchased the property right on 70 adjacent from um, the Happy Gospel Center I texted him asking for the exact address so I could give it to people but he said we're welcome to use that property I was ready to shout in my cubicle at work because <laughs> I think it's going to be so productive over there so that Amen. Just, Really a blessing for him. Yeah, that is going to be on the 23rd. And so if you want to know about all the times and all the details, see Sister Diane. Also, if you have anything that you would like to donate, the yard <laughs> sale is for youth camp fees, right? It is for youth camp or youth fund. Um, we would like to do it like a flea market style. And I have a sheet that I will start handing out on Sunday. I was hoping to have it tonight, but I didn't. My printer would not print. Um, because we would prefer it to be yard to be flea market style, so that not so that everybody's coming, they're setting up their own stuff, taking away their own stuff. And if you have a child going to camp, you keep your money for that camp. And if you don't, then you split it with us 50-50. And so that keeps from just like three or four people having this massive amount. But obviously, if you won't don't want to do a flea market booth, we will take your items to sell. Okay, everybody get that? She will take used cars. She will take boats, airplanes, yeah. anything like that. Okay? Um, just, I, I thank God for the work that is being done there. This past Sunday morning, we had our first meet and greet. And I'm going to tell you, I was so excited uh, to be able to have guests that we were able to uh, shake hands with, meet them. And I, I have got some very positive feedback even this week from that. And so what I'm asking you to do, if you bring a guest with you, and I, I hope that you will, will you make sure that you go with them to our meet and greet? Now, this next Sunday, it's going to be back over here in the young adult class. Uh, and i just like to shake their hand, let them know how much that we appreciate them being with us. And we give them a little, a little gift. And it is a cup that has some mints in it and a bottle of water. And I, I just want you to help us to pray that these things will be so effective and like I said the feedback I've already got from that this week is just absolutely exciting I want God to help us to do all that we can and reach in all the people that we can yeah. and uh, I want you to be part of it I want you to be part of it if you invite someone to church they may not want to go meet the preacher by herself but if you'll come on and say come on here I promise you he will not bite and if he has if he does bite he's had his shots he does not have rabies and uh, so everything's all right on that, okay? Uh, just keep praying. I want God to really touch us. And if you will, stick around after the service tonight. There's a, about three items I want to go over with you and share with you. And I really want God to uh, really help us. I just want God to build an explosive excitement on the inside of us. Brother Rick's coming to sing, and I am so thankful God has touched his voice, the word that he can sing and teach and tell people about Jesus. Trust 
Church, he was asking, he said, Brother Spratley, can I play the drums? <laughs> yes, yes. I tell you, I just want God to use all of our young yes, people. Amen. 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 I want God to use all of our young people. I want God to use all of us. Amen. All of us. Well, tonight I'm going to take you, if you will, or go with me to the book of St. Mark, chapter 4. And I want to read verses 3 through 8. Verses 3 through 8. A very familiar passage of scripture here. The Lord has actually been dealing with my heart on this message probably about a month. And it just keeps growing and growing. So I hope that you got to about midnight tonight. I don't think I could last to midnight. I, I want to take you here though and I, I am so thankful that God's word it's not boring. Amen. Right. His word is alive. Yes, it is. And it seems like the more you read it, the more lively it becomes, the more it will speak to you. The, the Bible is not a book that you can pick up one time and read it and say, all right, I read that novel. And it, no, it doesn't work that way. But tonight I want to take you to a very simple parable. And I'm probably going to share some things with you that you've never heard because I've never heard them. That doesn't mean that you have it. But in, in, this, in this parable, I find a lot of things. And what I, I really admire about Christ, Christ would speak things that would relate to the people that were listening to him. And I, I want this message tonight to relate to you and I. In Mark, the fourth chapter, in verse number three, he said, Hearken 
Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. Will you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, I ask for your blessings upon this service and the anointing of God upon the word and upon the messenger. I cannot do this, Lord, without you. Father, the ears that will hear tonight will not receive and understand except that your spirit would touch their ears to hear and open up their understanding. God, even as you have touched mine, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would speak to us tonight. God, that in this service that we will find a new fresh hunger, desire, Lord, to be everything that you want us to be. Father, once again, I thank you for the blessings upon this service, but I ask to God that the rest of the service tonight will be blessed by the hands of the Master. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Turn around and shake hands with somebody and tell them it's so good to see you so to Wednesday see you. night. So good to see you on Wednesday. So good to see you on Wednesday. Brother, it's good to see you. Hallelujah. God's so good to us, isn't he? I can't even tell you that I have a, a title for the message tonight. Unless that it would be preparing the soil. Getting the soil ready is the most important thing that you can do in a garden. And I want to ask you tonight to please... Follow along with me. <coughs> Follow along with me. And I, I don't want to lose you. And I do not want you to get offensive at the first part of this message. Because the way I'm about to start this thing out, you're probably going to think that it's a kindergarten trying to explain something. But in the book of Judges, there was a time, I believe it was after that Gideon died, that there was a one that went and uh, killed all of his brothers, except for one. And then later on he stood up on the hillside and began to cry back out and began to speak as if that the plants were speaking. And he talked about the trees. He talked about the vine. And said that they was asked, why should I give this up? Anybody remember reading that? Because I don't want to lose you. In this tonight, I want you to picture with me a field that can be planted. It can grow great things. But it is covered with the most beautiful grass. It looks like it is a manicured lawn. It looks like it is so well watered. And what do you think the grass would say if you went to it and told the grass, we are going to come break you all up we're going to plant a garden here. If the grass could talk, what would it say? This afternoon as I was praying and asking God to, to speak to my heart, all of this stuff just started pouring into my mind and I'm thinking, Lord, you know, help us. Because I believe that this grass no doubt would begin to argue its rights. Why do you want to come and bust me up? Why do you want to come and till up all of this ground? I've been here. I've done my job. I've held the soil together. I don't look bad. In fact, I'm in pretty good condition. I've prevented erosion in the time of the storms and in the time of the rains. So why do you want to go bust up all this beautiful ground? And if you was trying to explain to that, that beautiful grass, because I want to plant something in here that will produce fruit that's edible for us. I still believe that grass would want to argue with you. And the thing is, no doubt, there's the rock that you're going to find as you begin to try to 
turn the ground and no doubt that rock, if it could speak to you, it would say, it tried to move me before, but nobody's ever moved me. Why do you want to get rid of me? I've been the rock. I want to plant something here that will grow and produce fruit, produce vegetables. And no doubt the rock would tell you, I've been here all of these times and I'm heavy. I carry a lot of weight. And you try to move me, you have a task on your hands. It's going to be tough because I've been here. I'm siding up with the grass. The grass has all of its roots. It's so pretty, just like it is. Why do you want to mess it up? Why do you want to mess it up? So whenever you go back into the Word of God and where that the Word of God said that it's time to break up the fallow ground, that's exactly what would happen. You'd have to go in and break up the ground where there are roots. There's grass. There's stones. There's rocks. There's boulders. I have yet to break up a fresh piece of ground without running into some obstacle. Amen. I mean, I've looked at the fields and you'd think there's nothing below the surface there Everything is just perfect. All I have to do is run over it with a disc. And then you see the disc bounce up. So then you have to get the old turn plow. Now I ran into places where that the old tractor just stopped. An old turn plow hit something. And something said, I'm not moving. He said, oh yeah, we're going to plant a garden here. And that, and that old tractor spinning its wheels. Sometimes it wants to come up in the air. It's trying and, and sometimes breaking up that fallow ground is so hard. It's so hard. And sometimes you get to thinking, well, if I can just get this part broke up, everything else is going to go easy. But that's just the first part of planting a garden. That's just the first part of planting a, a place. And once that grass is broken up and, and the soil up underneath of it it looks like it, it's ready to be prepared for planting of the seeds that's going to provide food. You know, you're wanting to go out and uh, you're wanting to plant uh, vegetables in there. Or maybe you want to plant you some bush beans or black-eyed peas. And, and uh, sometimes I wish I could plant cornbread alone to go along with that so that way you can just go out and pick it all. But we know it don't happen that way, does it? But the garden... It, 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 does, it does what the grass can do, but much more. I understand what I just said. The grass says I'm covering, I'm preventing erosion, and yet if the garden is prepared right, it can be as pretty. It can be as desirable, or even more so. But it says I am producing something that is more than for the cows and the goats. I'm producing something that will feed you, that will take care of you. And that garden, if it could really begin to try to talk to you, it would tell you there are some risks in trying to break up that fallow ground. And I started thinking about that because there were times that we broke the hoe. There were times that we broke the shovel. There were times that we had pins in the plow and we would hit things and the pins would snap and the plow would turn up in the air and you'd think, oh no, we can't plow like that, so you had to go back. There was risk of breaking things. There was risk of something tearing up, but we would go through that because we knew the plan was we wanted to have a garden. Yes, there was times that we lost the grass and the grass would never come back to be the same. There were times that those rocks that had been there so long they were stacked up now on the side. They were no longer buried in the ground. And whenever you begin to look at all of this, you, you have to assume the, the position of, of God in all of this, they, they can only see it as I am the grass. 
And I am here. I've been here. But God says there's so much more that you can be. That there's so much more potential than being the hey. Come on. There's much more potential than being St. Augustine grass. I realize that it all has its place, but if you're going to plant a garden, then that, that grass has to go. And if you're not careful, we the people, we can be spiritually blinded to the harvest and we cannot see the need of letting the grass go. Not grow, go. We cannot see the need of moving a rock. We cannot see a need of moving the boulder. And so God has to open our eyes to let us see that there can be a harvest here. What I have found out and since I've been here, I've had some people that's been very honest with me. And they've told me, said, I don't see a harvest in Semerset. So I can see one in Manatee County, but I just don't see a harvest in Samoset. But it takes somebody with a vision to say there is a harvest in Samoset. And sometimes you have to break up the fallow ground to get the harvest to come up. And there was a lot of different illustrations. The Bible even speaks about one man that just went out and just sowed the seed. And day and night went by and the seed began to come up. And it was only whenever the seed began to come up that he noticed that the weeds or the thorns or thistles were coming up with it. And we read about that parable. But I don't want to eat grass. I don't want to try to boil a rock until it's soft enough for me to eat it. I, I, I like watching Bugs Bunny. I do. I, I like those old cartoons. I like watching Tom and Jerry. And sometimes Tom gets something in his mouth and when he opens it up, all of his teeth are just broke. You know what I'm saying, don't you? Well, that's what would happen if I tried to eat a rock. Right. And, and rocks are not desirable. I mean, you can boil them all day long. You're not going to have no nutrition even in the water that you have boiled them in. Right. And so then I want to move on to something else because in this illustration that the Lord gave, he said that there was a time whenever that the seed would come up. And then he said that uh, the, it fell among the thorns and it grew up, but it was choked, and it yielded no fruit. So the Lord began to deal with me on not only preparing the ground, but you have to be a keeper of the ground. The keeper of the ground cannot go out there with a tractor with a, a big old plow hooked up behind it and say, I'm going to go down these roads. No, you won't. You'll bury every plant you have in the garden. You'll destroy your garden. So the keeper of that garden, he knows that the process of gardening is ongoing. If you go over there and you break up the fallow ground, you turn the stony ground and, and all that hard, uh, farmland, it can be very difficult. But once that seed is planted, you need someone to care for it or you need somebody to mind the garden. You need somebody to mind what has been planted. These workers are workers that keep things so that the garden benefits the most. And I, I begin to think, if you have a garden, it's so important to water the garden. Right. But if you overwater the garden, you'll drown your plants. Right? And you have to fertilize. You have to put nutrients out there. But you can also burn your plants up by putting too much on them. True. I want you to picture this even in a spiritual garden. Because then there comes a time that the garden needs to be cultivated. And often that means you're going back and you're breaking up the ground that has begun to get a little hard. But this time you have to use a little bit more precision. I remember whenever that we would have our gardens and I'd get Dustin and Shree out there with us and, and number one, they did not like a hoe in their hand. Okay? And if you told them, 
That's fine. Just get down and pull up the weeds. They did not like pulling up weeds either. All right? And, but if you get the hoe and you just start running down every row, if you're not careful, you're going to cut the plant. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're not careful, you're going to kill what you're trying to produce. And so the person minding the garden has to be so careful in what they're doing. But they feel like that's what I'm skilled at. I, I can remember when I first started trying to grow corn, I'd go and I'd put a sprinkler system on it and, and I'd water it for two hours and I'd think, boy, that should be enough water. How many people ever try to grow corn? Do you think two hours of water in that corn was enough? I don't know what kind of a sprinkler system you had. I don't know what kind of a ground you had. But I want to tell you where that we were planting ours. I would get aggravated because I'd go out and I'd think, ooh, this looks so good. And when I look behind me where I'm walking and all that dirt sticking to my feet, and what's right up underneath that dirt? Dry dirt. And I think I, I'm taking all the moisture out of the garden with me. And I thought I had put enough on there. But then if you're not careful, you can let the sprinkler run too long until it begins to wash away all the beds and and begins to destroy what you've tried to build up. And so in minding that garden, you have to be careful. You have to know how to cultivate it. You, you, know, you have to know how to go back in and get down to where that the roots are and make sure that the nutrients are getting in there, the water is getting in there. You have to do precision weeding so that way you do not destroy the garden. How many of you have ever had a garden? How many of you have ever pulled up a weed and pulled up your plant? <laughs> Why? You did not realize that the weed had its roots that went down and started wrapping up around that beautiful little bean plant. And when you pulled up the weed, you know the rest is history, don't you? But this garden, it produces... And please hear me. A garden produces by multiplication and not by addition. The garden, if you plant a seed for beans, you don't want to walk out there and see just one pod. And if you did see one pod, it would normally have multiple beans in that pod. Am I right? But what are you looking for? Are you not looking for the plant to be loaded? Right? You're, you're looking for many beans to be upon that plant. And even if you plant corn, a lot of times you may only get one ear of corn off of that stalk. But whenever you look at the ear, how many seeds are on that ear? Sometimes in if you're really taking good care of it, you may have two or three ears, maybe four, that you can gather, you can reap all of that one stalk of corn. But what I want you to understand is this, that you're not expecting a, a, an addition. You're looking for something to multiply, to multiply. Just bear with me right here. I'm just going over some of the things that God really put into my heart. The, the right planning of this garden, it shows multiple things. You plant where that plant will get the best for what it needs. There's some plants that need indirect sunlight. There's some plants that can handle sunlight all day long. And there's some that need indirect. Someone may need some shade. And so you have to figure out what you want to plant, where you want to plant it. And then you also have to figure the soil type. Will this soil produce? Does it have the nutrients in it? Is it the right pH level? You didn't know that you was coming tonight to get a lesson on growing plants, did you? Just, just hold on and follow along with me here. Because it, it can get complicated. 
I, I wish that growing a garden was simply going out, throwing out some seed, and all the weeds would die, and, and it would just grow up, and you never had to water it, you never had to fertilize it, but that's just a dream world. God never made it to be like that. So it's not going to be like that. And today when I started looking at this, you know, I, I started thinking also in planting your garden, you're going to look for a short term and you're looking for a long term. You're, you're looking for something that can grow and start producing pretty quick. Right? Right? Those are the plants that you're going to begin to rejoice over and you're, it's going to encourage you then to be patient to wait on the other ones that are coming up. And I, I started thinking about, I like to grow tomatoes. And I really got to the place, I, like, I would rather grow them in a, a big pot. It seems like it was just a, a better controlled environment. And I could, whenever I put the fertilizer to it, I didn't have to worry about it running down in the ground and and addressing all the weeds and all of that growing with it. But guess what? It does not always happen that way, does it? But I, I learned that even a young tomato plant can start producing tomatoes. And then I still watch it as it begins to grow. The bigger it gets, the more tomatoes. I begin to expect out of that. So in short term, I can say, all right, I believe that I can start uh, receiving some fruit from the tomatoes uh, in just a short amount of time, I, I started looking that there were some types of spinach that you could harvest in 30 days after planting. There are potatoes that can be ready two to three months after planting. And then um, there were different types of lettuce and, and uh, the varieties that were so different. Radishes could be ready in 25 days. And then they talked about how that the greens off of some of these plants were ready before the root was ready. And how that the baby carrots could be ready in 30 days, but if you wanted the big carrots, you had to wait 50 days. Follow along with me. Because all of these had their time to reap. The bush beans were 50 days. Some were produced uh, one and growing, one tomato at a time. Others produced multiple at a time and some will continue to produce for the season others will only produce one time for the season I started thinking if you wanted to look at the long term of it then you could go out and plant you a citrus tree because it's going to be four or five years down the road before you really uh, benefit from the fruit off of that tree and especially if you wanted it to be used in a commercial setting, I, I started thinking about how that you would plant according to the room, according to the space that the plant needs. How many of you still with me? You you had you you had to look. There are some plants that can be closer together than others. They said the fruit trees could need anywhere from twelve to twenty five feet apart. Corn needed to be planted an inch and a half to two inches deep, four to six inches apart. The rows need to be 30 to 36 inches apart. And said that it's always better if you can plant multiple rows of corn instead of just one row of corn. So the pollination ratio is, is so much greater. But you have to learn how close to plant. Now with my dad, he had this theory. Not every seed is going to come up, so you go back and you sow it thick. And then you go through there and you begin to pull out what he would call the sucker plants. Yeah. Plants that he didn't want in there. Yeah. He, he wanted the healthy, the big plants. And so he would go through there and begin to pull out the little small ones, and which would then give more nutrients and, and water and more attention to the other ones. You also had to pay attention to the plants that were being planted around it. I learned some of this from, from experience, to be honest with you. Uh, we had planted some cayenne peppers next to some banana peppers. How many of you know what happened? We had cayenne peppers that tasted like banana peppers, and we had banana peppers that tasted like cayenne peppers. They cross-pollinated. Sure, I mean, it looked like a, 
Hakaya, but it tasted like a banana pepper. <laughs> that happens in others. They tell you not to plant watermelons next to cucumbers because of the cross pollination that takes place in them. So you want plants that's going to complement each other and not try to change the flavor of the other. Right? How many of you know that this could get really deep spiritually? It, it can. But Jesus is speaking to people in parables because they knew what he was talking about. What God began to deal with my heart on is this, that the seed that fell by the wayside fell upon soil that was not prepared for the planting. The seed that fell upon stony places fell upon a place that was not prepared for the planting. The seed that grew up and yet the thorns came up around it was a place that no doubt at one time had been prepared for the planting but no one cared for it afterwards. Here in our troubles lie in a lot of churches. As I've talked with people who said once I got saved I had no one to tell me what I would face. I had no one I could turn to for support. I had no one to really encourage me. And so it's almost like as the thorns were coming up, it would come up and the cares of this life would choke them out because they had no one minding the garden. Nobody caring for the field that had been planted. And, and the Lord just began to deal with my heart upon, upon the conditioning and how that we must keep it conditioned. You see, I, I've been raised in the church all of my life. And, and a lot of your Pentecostal churches are guilty of rejoicing over seeing people get saved. But few have taken the step that needs to be taken to help to disciple and encourage those that have got saved. The follow-up programs to care for young Christians has almost been diminished. A lot of churches don't even care. There is no follow-up. What even amazes me is this, of the people that have passed through our church. Sister Leah sends out a card, and I try to send out a letter, and sometimes we may call them. How many people responded back to us and said, you are the first church that ever made contact with us after we left your service? And I'm thinking, but God, I still feel like that we're falling so short. If we're not careful, we can make the initial contact. But then what's going to happen later on? What happens if they keep coming back? Are we just going to let them roast in the sun? Are we going to let them fall upon that stony ground? Or will we ask God to help us to prepare the, the ground? Now follow along with me, okay? I, I know that what I'm about to tell you is it, not part of the parable. But there have been times when a plant was not doing good in one place that we could transplant it into a different location and the plant would turn out to be beautiful. Yeah. Right? And sometimes God has to help us to get people in the right place so that way they can grow. Sometimes God has to get us in the right place to where that we can grow. And so God needs people. God needs people of all kinds. I mean all kinds of people. God, God needs people that will see the need of having a garden. Right? right? And I, I'm just going to throw something in here to you. I'm going to throw four words at you. And I'm hoping that they will stick in your mind like glue. God needs some finders. God needs some binders. God needs some minders and God needs some grinders. That finder is one that says we have need of a garden. We need something that is going to produce a garden. We, we need something that is going to grow and be fruitful. And that, that finder may be a, a person that is sporadic. It could be a person of chaos. It could be one that just sees a, a vision. But then he says, I need some help. 
Because I don't know how to get a garden started. And so here comes out the binder. That binder comes out and says, look, I know how to organize. I know how to plan. I, need, I know how to find what you need to make a successful garden grow and produce the best garden that you can ever have. And can I be honest with you? In real life, there's been times that I have sought the advice of other people that have had successful gardens. I, I had one man in, in Nocatee. He could grow some of the most beautiful black-eyed black eyed pea plants. And whenever you started talking to him, he would tell you how that it all come to pass. You see, he, he would spend the winter and he would spend the spring raking up all the old oak leaves that he could get. And then he would go just screw them out over an area and take a tiller and just start tilling them all into the ground. And he would do this and do it and do it until the time of planting. I never would have thought of that. In fact, I don't like raking leaves. <laughs> but he did that and the results was he could grow some of the most beautiful plants. So he knew how to organize. He knew how to... To, to put the plan together. And then the minder, they are the ones who says, you get it going, I can keep it going. You get it planted, you get it growing, I'll be right here and I'll keep it organized for you. I will keep it, I, I, I'll keep plenty of water on it and make sure I don't overwater it. I, I'll put plenty of fertilizer around it and I'll make sure I don't burn them up. And I'll make sure that the soil is cultivated. I'll make sure to know what I'm about to pull up is not connected to the roots of another plant. And so that minder is someone that can come along and just say, hey, I can take care of this. I could not have organized it, but since you have it organized, I can keep it organized. True? True? If you looked at my office, you'd say, you are not a binder and you're not a minder. <laughs> and I tell people, I think what I am is a finder and a grinder. What is a grinder? A grinder is one that says, I don't mind getting my hands dirty. I don't mind putting my back to the task. I want to know what I need to do. Help me keep going in the right direction. And I'm going to be very open and honest with you tonight. I believe that in every church, God has finders, binders, minders, and grinders. And there's not one to look down on the other. But we all work together in unity to build the greatest garden that we can grow and make it to be the most productive garden that it can be. I want God to help us. I, I want God to help me to know. I, I, I started rereading a book that is entitled Relaunch. And in this book he talks about even as a pastor, as an executive, as a chairperson, he said you have to learn how to take the advice of other people that are around you and he said, if you don't learn how to take advice from other people that are around you, it will not be long until everything around you starts falling apart. Because you're not able to see everything like other people are able to see that. One of the, one of the times that God really began to change my, my way of thinking, even about pastoring, was in Nocatee, where I had a business meeting. And I was meeting with the men, and I was sure that I had the right answer. I was sure that I had the right plan. And I had a, an elderly man in that meeting who was a businessman. I, I'm telling you, he knew how to take care of business and he knew how to take care of money. He knew how to make money. He knew how to save money. And in that meeting, he was not mean. He was not disrespectful. He just simply said, Pastor, have you considered this? And when we did, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, no, I haven't. I am so glad you said something. Because his idea of what he was sharing was from experience and it was from productivity. And so I, I learned. 
I learned in the early part of my ministry, even while uh, one of my first churches at Lodi, as I was sitting in my office and I heard my Sunday school superintendent over there, he said this and this and this, and I'm thinking, I'll deal with him. And the Lord spoke to me and said, as I called you the pastor of the church, I called him to be Sunday school superintendent, and you need to leave him alone. I said, okay, God. You, you mean God will do that to you? Yep. Absolutely. Because God means for us to be a family. He means for us to be able to work together. He means for us to be able to, 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 to actually grow from each other's gifts. Right. From each other's callings. And I want God to help me to do that. I, I don't want to stifle nobody's growth. and I don't want to kill anybody's gifts. But I want God to help me to know how to release people into their ministry, into their calling, into what that they're good at doing. God has blessed this church with some of the best binders and minders that I've ever had to work with. I mean that. You, you're talking about organ, organizing things. You're talking about putting things together. Uh, I mean, they can do it. Been very blessed there. But God also wants the grinder that's thinking, I don't have a mind like them to step up and say, look, I might not be able to organize it and I might not be able to care for it like this one, but if you'll tell me what to do, here's my hands and here's my back. That, that person is not any less mentally. They're not any less spiritually. You just have to understand that that grinder it is one that says, if you will just show me the details of this project, if you will just give me some direction, I will work hard. I will work diligently. I will work with great discretion. I will do everything I can to help make this work. God has a place for every one of us. And God just wants us to step up and not be ashamed of what we are. So many times I have been praying and saying, God, why did you wire me like you did? I see some of these other guys, man, it, it's just like they can love on everybody and pat them on the back and brag on them. And they're just, they're people I don't like. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, they never meet a stranger. I do. But God has wired everybody differently. I really do like them. Okay, I really do. But you understand what I'm saying. There's some people that I can look at in envy and say, God, if you call me the pastor, then why didn't you give me the personality that person has? Because there's some people that are turned off by that personality. And so God knows why he wired every one of us like he did. And so God help us all to realize that we are a body that God has joined together. Not to try to make someone else look bad, but we are to uplift. We are to encourage. We're to try to make each other look good in the gifts and in the callings that God has given unto them. And every one of us are special. Every one of us can make contact and every one of us can, can touch people that nobody else can touch. Nobody else. We're special. God chose us. He did not choose us to live back in 1890. He chose us to live in 2019. Right? And God knew what he was doing where he made us. And I want God to use us. It seems like that God has just really been laid on my heart, especially for Wednesday nights. To, to go back and to look at the parables and see how that God wants the church to develop and be used of him in reaching people for Jesus. Because we all have that part. There, there may be some of you that you may never personally win one person to Christ. But yet God can say, I'm going to use you that whenever that person has come to know me, you're going to be there to surround them and you're going to be the one to encourage them and you're going to be the one to show them because that's what you can do. And you are just as important as a man that can get out there and 
beat the bushes and, and talk to everybody, win them all to the Lord, but he may not have the gift to bring them in and hold them and encourage them. He, he, his gift may be just lead them to the cross. You know, here I am. I'm bringing them to the cross. I'm bringing them to the cross. But God needs somebody that's going to meet them at the cross. Right. And that is just as vital as a person that's bringing them to the cross. And I want God to help us. I do. God is, is challenging. He is challenging my heart. He is challenging my mind. And I find myself so many times saying, God, I cannot do this, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You may be sitting here tonight saying, Preacher, I feel like God wants me to do some things, but I can't do them. And I'll tell you, you're right. But if you will start obeying God, God will do it through you. Because God's looking for a willing vessel. Moses all the time went hollering and screaming all the way back to Egypt saying, God, I cannot do it. And God was telling Moses all the time, you're right, you're not going to have to do it. I'm just going to use you. I'm going to do the work. You just do what I tell you to do and I'm going to do the rest. And we know that God did the rest. Look at the plagues. Look how God parted the water. And the same thing with Joshua. Joshua is absolutely paranoid. And, and you know, sometimes we deal with insecurities. How about you? You ever deal with insecurities? And, and the, Joshua did. He's kind of following the footsteps of Moses. And God said, that's all right, son. Today is the day that I'm going to show all these people that as I was with Moses, I am with you. It's not about you, Joshua. It's about me working through you. And I want that to be the heartbeat of this church right here. It's not about us. It's about God working through us. It's not about us. It's about, it is about promoting the kingdom of an almighty God. And building it, encouraging one another, and loving on one another. You know, there's so many people today, all that they need is somebody to love on them. They really do. And I want God to use me. I want God to use me. Now, I'm going to be quite honest with you, and I'm going to close. Sister, more if you can come to the piano for me. Many times God yanks me out of my comfort zone. But as long as I'm in my comfort zone, I'm thinking I can do this. When God takes me out of the comfort zone, I'm saying, God, you got to do this. Yeah. See the difference? Right. God's not looking for me to come up to something and say, don't worry, God, I got this. Right. No, God's waiting for me to say, I've got to have your help. God, help me to do this. I'm telling you tonight, every one of us are capable of being what God wants us to be. Amen. Every one of us. Will you stand with me tonight? I really want God to use us. I want God to prepare my heart for what he wants to plant. I don't want to resist him. I've been serving God just about all my life. You've heard me tell you I started preaching at the age of 12. A friend, there's been a lot of times in that span between 12 and 57 that God's really had to jerk me around and say, hey, you're not doing what I want you to do. You, you mean, Brother Sprout, no, listen to me. God challenges us. And whenever we get to the place that we don't think that we need Him to do it for Him, then God's going to say, I want to take you over here to something else. I heard a, a, a minister say here in the past few days, he said, it's like every nine to ten years he said God would change my ministry. About the time that I would start feeling comfortable, God began to challenge me to go to something else and it was a repeat because at the beginning of that ministry I was saying, God, I can't do this. And God was saying, you're right, you can't, but I can. Ten years later he's feeling confident in what he is doing and God is saying, now, step over here, God, I can't do this. You're right, you can't, but I can and so now he's back to trusting God. Now he's back to praying and saying, God, show me. After all, this is not my ministry. God, it is your ministry. It's your work.
I want you, if you can tonight, because I just want it to be a sign of unity. And if you can, will, will you just come and join me here across the front of the church tonight? Now, I want you to pray with me that God will use our church. I want you to pray with me that God will use this church to bring honor and glory unto Him. I, I want God to challenge us. I really want God to challenge our hearts to be used of Him. It's one thing for us to say, Jesus used me, but it's another thing to be used of Him, isn't it? Brother Carl was telling me that whenever he was going through some of the toughest times of his life, he said God would bring that soul back to him. It talks about that if one soul is saved, it's worth it all. If I can help one person, Sister Joan, make it to heaven, it's going to be worth it all. I may not be the one to lead them to Jesus Christ, but Jesus may use me to help, to keep them, grow them, to be everything that God wants them to be. This is what I want you to pray tonight. I'm not going to ask you to pray, Lord, make me a soul winner. I'm not going to ask you to ask God to make you a binder, minder, or a grinder. I just want you to say, God, you show me what you want me to be and help me to be what you would have me to be. Can you pray it tonight? Father, I come before you tonight. I know, Lord, that you're seeing the hearts of everyone that is gathered here. Lord, I want to be used of you. I want to be used of you. I just want to be used of you. God, you make me what you want.
Will you take just a moment now and pray with me? God, bind us together. Bind us together with your love and with cords that only the Holy Ghost can put. God, help us, Lord, to fill our place in the ministry of this church. God, help us to fill our place in the ministry of this church. Father, please hear us tonight. God, I'm asking you.